than 25 years, I've been holding on to this story, but the time has come to share it. I could have kept it hidden until my last breath, but I want to unburden myself before I face my Maker. My time left on this earth is limited. The consequences of years of heavy smoking have caught up with me, and the cancer that began in my lungs has spread uncontrollably. The doctors have given me a maximum of six months to live. This is my last chance for confession. In theory, the historical inquiries team could still pursue legal action for the crimes I'm about to admit, but the likelihood is that I'll be gone and laid to rest before any trial takes place. So here is my story, whether it be for better or worse. I was born and raised in North Belfast during the 1970s, a period when the violent turmoil of the Troubles engulfed my homeland. Much like many of my generation, I was drawn into the vortex of violence that raged on the streets of my community. Growing up on the Protestant side of the Divide, my father, a former soldier, and my mother, a devoted follower of Reverend Ian Paisley, firmly entrenched my allegiance. My identity was that of an Ulsterman, and I identified as British. I felt resolute in my determination to protect my identity and secure the future of my people. My involvement started during my early teens with truancy from school to participate in clashes with Catholic youths across the Divide. As time passed, the violence escalated, and I was drawn into the ranks of Loyalist paramilitaries. These local toughs believed that the police and army were insufficient, and it was our responsibility to take matters into our own hands. We waged a brutal conflict against the IRA and its sympathizers within the Catholic community. Yet now I realize that what I perceived as defending my people's future was, in reality, partaking in a ruthless, sectarian killing machine. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My story commences during the summer of 1998, marked by the signing of the Good Friday Agreement a few months prior. In theory, peace had settled upon our land, yet the harsh reality was that violence persisted. Loyalists clashed with security forces over the Drumcree March, while Republican dissidents perpetrated atrocities like the OMAG bombing. During this period, I lived in what is referred to as an interface area in Belfast. This meant my neighborhood lay on the border between Catholic and Protestant districts, divided by a so-called peace wall, a physical barrier constructed to separate the communities and reduce violence. My house faced this wall, situated directly across the street. A roundabout and a small row of shops used by both communities marked the end of the wall at the end of our road. This location was a hot spot for riots over the years, even witnessing several murders. I had just finished serving four years in the Mays prison for paramilitary-related charges. I had promised my wife I would steer clear of trouble and focus on our young family. Regrettably, this promise was one I failed to uphold. Amid heavy rioting that summer, several neighbors fled, but those of us who stayed adopted defensive measures within our homes. The man of the house, or father, would sleep on the ground floor, armed with a hatchet or baseball bat for protection. The wife and children would sleep in the rear of the house near an escape route. Windows were fortified or fitted with steel cages to thwart petrol bomb attacks. As an additional precaution, we filled the bathtub with cold water and kept a bucket nearby to extinguish fires swiftly. Needless to say, this was an unfit environment for raising a family. My wife left, taking our children to live with her parents. The day she departed remains etched in my memory. Her furious screams, our children sobbing by her side. Four years. I waited four bloody years for you. The hardships I endured. The shame of my husband being in prison. You promised this was behind us. You assured me you'd distance yourself from those individuals and prioritize our family. What's gotten into you? Is the flag, your cause, more important than your own children? What about me? I remained silent during her impassioned outburst. What could I say? I didn't want to lose my family, but I knew they would be safer away from the chaos. Why didn't I go with them? That's a question I can't answer satisfactorily. At the time, I felt compelled to stay and defend our home. I believed my children would eventually appreciate the stand I took for their future. Now I recognize it was my ego that kept me there, the decision I'll lament until my last breath. In some ways, the riots of the 98 mirrored those we had witnessed on many occasions before. Youths from both sides clashing, hurling bricks and makeshift projectiles. Periodically, paramilitary gunmen from either faction would emerge, 
spraying the riot zone with bullets. Eventually, the security forces would intervene, rolling in with armored vehicles and APCs, firing plastic bullets to disperse the rioters. However, both sides predictably targeted these armored vehicles with rocks and petrol bombs. This cycle of violence was the norm back then, but something was different about the rioting that summer. The residents sensed it, an unspoken realization that darkness was descending upon our beleaguered community. Late at night, after the rioters scattered and the armored vehicles retreated, an eerie, otherworldly wail pierced the silence. I distinctly remember lying on my sofa, clutching my hatchet, as the agonizing screams invaded my ears. The horrific, gut-wrenching sound chilled me to my core, invoking a primal fear. The worst part, I had heard that wail before and I understood its meaning. My story unfolds over three consecutive nights in July 1998, coinciding with the 12th, a Protestant commemoration of William of Orange's victory over Catholic James II in the 17th century. Yet that year there was little to celebrate. Both communities were about to learn the consequences of our bitter conflict, a harsh lesson delivered by an otherworldly force beyond our mortal comprehension. On the tenth afternoon, I took advantage of a lull to buy cigarettes from a local shop. A young woman behind the counter, recognizable as a Catholic resident, met me with a hostile glare. She likely recognized me too well, her resentment palpable as she rang up my purchase, carelessly tossing my change. Suppressing the urge to react, I collected my coins and left without a word. Outside, I ran into an old comrade in arms. He strolled toward me with confidence, his bald head capped by a baseball hat, and his grin exuded self-assuredness. Well, 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 if it isn't you, he boomed. Reluctantly, I shook his hand, feeling as though I compromised my dignity by doing so. Hey, Victor, how are things? I replied half-heartedly. Going strong, mate, going strong. Those bastards over there are keeping us busy. He gestured toward the wall, making his target clear. I nodded in agreement, avoiding his gaze as I added, Yes, it's been rough lately. Probably going to get worse in the coming days. Absolutely, Victor confirmed, an evil grin for me. But we'll show them a thing or two, mark my words. He pointed at the tattered Union Jack fluttering in the wind above us. We'll make sure our flag flies over this district, no doubt about it. Pausing, he looked at me with icy intent. It's a shame you lack the guts to fight with us. His words hit me hard, and my initial instinct was to strike him. However, I knew that would only land me in trouble. Victor was the local OC of our loyalist paramilitary unit, responsible in theory for defending the district. In reality, he and his crew spent most of their time dealing drugs and extorting local businesses for their gain. Nonetheless, Victor had gained power during my absence warranting a certain level of respect. So I swallowed my pride and responded, Yes, Victor. I'll do my part when the time comes, but I'm no longer part of the organization. I've done my share. Victor's malicious grin broadened as he nodded. Right, you've served your time. Remind me, how many years did they give you? Though he knew the answer, I replied through clenched teeth, recounting my charges. I received a seven-year sentence, but I served four illegal firearm possession and membership in a prescribed group. Victor stared into my eyes before uttering his next words. Yes, they got you on those charges, but not the major one, isn't that right? I felt a punch to my gut as painful memories flooded back. Struggling to speak, I managed to say through quivering lips, no, I wasn't convicted of that. Victor's sadistic grin grew. We go way back, you and me. Don't forget that before you get all righteous on me, lad. With a pat on my back, he walked away, calling back over his shoulder. Goodbye, mate. See you tomorrow night. And he vanished, leaving me to my thoughts. Unwilling to stew in an empty house and dwell on the past, I decided to visit the local social club for company and a few pints. I stood at the heavily fortified entrance, pressing the intercom button, waiting for the buzz that allowed me to enter. Inside, the club boasted faded furniture, outdated wallpaper from the 70s, and walls adorned with symbols and images that celebrated Ulster's imperial legacy. Uniformed men, banners from local orange lodges, and memorials to fallen comrades. Above the bar, the Union Jack waved proudly, a symbol of our outpost of empire on the edge of enemy territory. The club was sparsely populated, a handful of regulars at the bar and a few more huddled in the corners. 
Approaching the bar, I greeted the manager, Johnny, ordered a lager, and paid with my loose change. With a nod to the bartender, I made my way to a table where two neighbors sat, nursing their drinks. The man with the pint was Chris. In his thirties, he was a friendly family man who worked as a taxi driver. He smiled as I approached, shaking my hand and offering me a seat. Chris was one of those affable individuals who avoided politics and religion, enabling him to drive his cab between both sides of the peace wall, catering to customers from both communities. However, Chris was naive about the risks of driving through the tumultuous streets of North Belfast late at night. I had warned him countless times, but he always brushed it off, saying, Why would anyone want to shoot me? Beside him sat Mary, a widow in her late forties, her face etched with grief. Her husband had died in a bombing two decades ago, a tragedy from which she never recovered. Her life had been consumed by sorrow and resentment as the conflict that claimed her husband's life continued to rage around her. She nodded curtly at me as I sat, taking a gulp of white wine before lighting a cigarette. Well, I said as I laid my pint glass down on the wooden table, I'm surprised to see the two of you drinking together. What is this, Protestant solidarity? Mary scoffed with contempt while Chris laughed boisterously at my joke further highlighting their different personalities. You'll never guess what Mary's been telling me, mate, exclaimed Chris. This you've got to hear. Mary shot him a furious look, and for a second I thought she'd throw her drink in Chris's face. So what's the story, Mary, I asked, half in jest. She took a long drag on her cigarette before answering. You foolish men like to mock me, but I see through your bravado. We've all heard it. The wailing late at night. You know it's not normal. Sure, that's just some kids fooling around, I shot back, trying to sound confident even though this talk of screaming in the dead of night chilled me to my very bones. Mary shook her head vigorously. You're dead wrong. The creature out there isn't human, not anymore at least. The stories say she was once a young woman living in this very city, but tragedy struck her down and she became possessed by an evil spirit from the other side. And now she stalks the streets and villages of this country seeking vengeance on those who wronged her in life. She paused, briefly looking me directly in the eye with a glare of fiery intensity. You understand, don't you? Deep down you know the truth. That monster out there is the Banshee. She is the harbinger of death, and she won't leave this place until she's claimed a soul. As soon as she finished speaking, Chris and I looked at each other across the table, and we simultaneously burst into hysterical laughter. The Banshee, I cried out, as tears of hilarity rolled down my cheeks. The harbinger of death, what a load of old bollocks. We kept laughing as Mary stood up, grabbing her glass before furiously storming away from our table, shouting angrily over her shoulder. You'll see, you foolish men will learn the hard way. Evil is coming to our street, mark my words. Once she was safely out of earshot, I whispered to Chris, saying, Crazy old bat, she hasn't been right in the head for years. I... Chris replied as the smile disappeared from her face. It's sad, really. I guess I feel sorry for her. Yeah, I agreed solemnly whilst emptying my pint glass. Want another one? The second pint turned into a third, a fourth, and then a fifth. Soon the two of us were stumbling out the door, slapping each other on the backs as we said our goodbyes. It was dark now and the street was abandoned, or so it appeared. I'd walked halfway down the road whilst keeping a weary eye on the peace wall, as I expected trouble to break out at any moment. But I was shocked when I saw a dark figure standing on the street in front of me, blocking my route home. Most of the streetlights had been smashed by the rioters, and so the road was shrouded in darkness. I couldn't make out the features of the mysterious person, but somehow I knew that he or she was staring directly at me. I've been in more than a few dangerous situations in my time, and I don't scare easily. But in that moment I experienced an almost primal terror as I felt cold all over and found myself frozen to the spot. A moment of appalling tension followed as the shadowy figure glared at me across the void and I was unable to avert my gaze. I wanted to open my mouth to challenge the interloper but couldn't find the words. It seemed like an eternity passed as I was trapped in this terrifying deadlock. Suddenly I heard shouting from behind me closely followed by the sound of smashing glass. I turned abruptly to see a gang of youth throwing bottles and crying out obscenities as they began the nightly ritual of violence. 
I only watched the young rioters for a few brief seconds before turning back towards the street ahead. I was astonished when I did so, because the mysterious stranger has disappeared, leaving the road empty and abandoned. I still felt extremely uneasy as I walked briskly back to my house, scanning back and forth whilst thinking I might be set upon by an unseen attacker. My hands were shaking almost uncontrollably as I fumbled for my keys and forced them into the lock. I stumbled inside of my house, slamming the door shut behind me. I felt an immense relief once I was safely indoors, silently chastising myself for being so foolish. I was already tipsy after my drinking session in the club, but my nerves were shot. So I unwisely decided to start on the whiskey to help me sleep, and I slowly drifted off into the world of dreams. I was thrown back in time, finding myself in a place I never wanted to return to. The young me sat in the passenger seat of a stolen Ford Cortina, gloves on my hands, and I nervously fiddled with a heavy .357 Magnum revolver. I glanced over to my companion who sat in the driver's seat, Victor. The young paramilitary put on a brave front, but I could tell he was as nervous as I was, tapping his finger on his knee as he smoked a cigarette. We both kept a close watch on the street, impatiently waiting for our target, whilst fearing we could be discovered at any moment. We were deep in enemy territory, a working-class Catholic district and known IRA stronghold. Our target was a known Republican activist who lived on this street, and our orders were to kill him. Victor and I were still youngsters, barely out of our teens and sent out on active service for the first time. Our OC had assigned us this job, and we knew we couldn't fuck it up. But our target was late. The intelligence said he should have been home from work hours ago, but we were still waiting. We had good reason to be nervous. If the RUC or Army found us in a stolen car with balaclavas and a loaded gun, we'd both be facing a lengthy prison sentence. Worse still, if the IRA found us on their turf, we'd likely end up in the morgue. Victor finished his cigarette, putting out the butt on the dashboard. For fuck's sake, where the hell is this bastard? He growled. I didn't answer, simply shaking my head in angry frustration. Victor tutted before continuing. If he doesn't turn up soon, we'll need to abort the mission. I shot him a furious look and spat. Really, mate? You want to go back and tell the boss we failed? Victor turned away, not wanting to meet my gaze. He knew I was right. Failure wasn't an option, and we couldn't go home until we'd taken a life. Suddenly there was movement on the dimly lit street as a figure casually strolled down the pavement across from us. I saw a middle-aged man with a stout belly and bald head dressed in a tweed suit and trench coat. I felt a surge of adrenaline as I sat forward in the car seat, trying to get a closer look at the man as he walked under the street lights. Victor saw him too, asking, Is that your man? I'm not sure, I replied anxiously. We'd seen photographs from stolen intelligence files, but it was difficult to identify the man in the dark. I'm not sure it's him, mate, Victor said solemnly. I don't know what happened, but something snapped inside of me in that moment. My heart was filled with rage and my mind was overwhelmed with images of Union Jacks draped over coffins and bombed buildings with fleeing civilians screaming in terror. I wanted bloody vengeance for the atrocities I'd witnessed and for the continuous attacks upon our people and, in that moment, I didn't care who paid the price. Fuck it, I spat with venom. He'll do. And with that, I opened the car door, pulling the balaclava over my face clutching a tight hold of my revolver as I stormed down the street towards my intended victim. He didn't see me coming, at least not at first. I was almost right on top of him before our eyes met under the dim light. At first his expression was one of confusion, but this turned to fear once he saw the gun in my hand. My intended victim was paralyzed in terror, unable to move from the spot as he stared down the barrel of my gun. My finger was poised on the trigger, but I couldn't pull it. I experienced a moment of self-doubt and just stood there, my hands shaking as I looked into the man's pleading eyes. I don't know how long passed as we faced off on the darkened pavement. Probably it was only seconds, but it felt like hours. But the tense standoff came to an abrupt end when the night air was suddenly filled with a god-awful scream, a hellish, almost inhuman wailing which almost deafened me. My victim's eyes widened and he tried to run. My instincts kicked in and I squeezed the trigger. Bang! The gun kicked back heavily in my hand and the bullet exploded in the man's chest, throwing his body backwards as he opened his mouth to emit a silent scream. Meanwhile, 
The disembodied shrieking continued, increasing in volume and pitch, assaulting my ears until I thought my head would explode. My victim was down on the pavement now, reeling in agony as he clawed at the gaping, bloody wound in his chest. I re-aimed and fired again and again. Each round was a dum dum bullet, and so the poor bastard's chest was torn open, revealing a bloody viscera of flesh and bone. I kept on shooting until I had an empty click, indicating that I'd fired all six rounds from the chamber. The victim lay motionless on the blood-soaked pavement, his dead eyes looking upwards at the night sky. Suddenly the screaming stopped, and I found myself alone on the street, standing over the corpse of the man I'd just brutally killed. My attention was then drawn to a window on the far side of the street, as a curtain twitched and a face appeared at the window. It was a young girl, perhaps seven or eight, her eyes filled with horror as she witnessed the bloody scene, her innocence shattered forever. Come on, for fuck's sake, came the sudden cry. I turned around and saw Victor shouting from the open window of the stolen car. His words brought me back to reality as I fled from the scene, jumping into the Cortina's passenger side and slamming the door shut. A second later, Victor put his foot down on the accelerator, and we sped down the street, making good our escape. Half an hour later and we were standing on top of Cave Hill, looking down on the city lights as the stolen car burned behind us. A second vehicle had arrived, driven by one of our comrades and tasked with bringing us to a nearby safe house. Once there, we would burn our clothes to destroy any forensic evidence, and the murder weapon would be wiped clean and returned to a hidden arms dump. And so, I'd gotten away with murder but knew I could never escape what I'd done. In that moment, I looked up into the night sky and wished God would summon a bolt of lightning to strike me down. But of course, I wouldn't get off so easily. Suddenly I awoke, jumping up from the sofa, my body covered in cold sweat as I struggled to breathe. Once again, I'd been forced to relive that fateful night from so many years ago in the form of a vivid nightmare. Now I was awake and all should have returned to normal. But something wasn't right. I had this awful feeling that I was being watched as my eyes quickly scanned the darkened room in a panic. My gaze was drawn to my closed curtains as I saw the dark shadow cast by a figure standing right outside my living room window. My eyes widened and whole body shook as I carefully crept towards the window, reaching out with a trembling hand as I slowly pulled the curtains back. What I saw on the other side was a living nightmare staring back at me, the face of what had once been a woman but was now transformed into something horrifying. I noted the creature's straggly black hair, pale white skin which was somehow illuminated by an unnatural light, and dark soulless eyes like those of a shark. I stood there for a time paralyzed in terror as I imagined I must still be dreaming, but then she opened her vile mouth to reveal a dark, gaping hole, and the sound she emitted was horrific but familiar. The banshee's wail, a high-pitched, inhuman scream which forced me back from the window as I covered my ears and rolled up into a ball, silently begging for the god-awful din to stop. The pain inside my skull was so intense that I thought I would pass out, but mercifully the hellish sound ended abruptly. My ears were still ringing as I shakingly pulled myself up onto my feet, grabbing the hatchet from behind my sofa and charging to the front door in an act of foolish bravado. A moment later and I was out on the street, but the creature was nowhere to be seen, having apparently disappeared without a trace. So I just stood there in a state of shocked awe, staring up at the stars as my body continued to shake, and tears rolled down my cheeks. The next night came around and I made my way to the eleventh night bonfire, standing on a patch of wasteland and watching as a towering pyre built of wood pallets and discarded tires were set alight. This was a part of our annual tradition as bonfires were lit across all the loyalist districts of Belfast as a fiery prelude to the marches and bands the next day. I didn't really want to be here. I was in no mood to celebrate after the events of the previous evening, but I didn't want to spend another night at home alone and risk a further encounter with that thing. There would usually be a party atmosphere at the event, but not this year. Sure, there were a few locals chatting and drinking cans of beer, but the overall atmosphere was tense and subdued. The violence of the previous days had put people on edge, but this was only part of the story. I think everyone in the whole estate had heard the Banshee's hellish wails in the dead of night. Perhaps others had been targeted by the demon like I had, 